The middle way approach is a mutually beneficial policy that is based on the principles of justice, compassion, nonviolence, friendship, and in the spirit of reconciliation for the well-being of entire humanity. It does not seek victory for oneself and defeat for others. The expression middle way is a, a Buddhist philosophical uh, terminology, which means avoiding all the streams and remain in the mid, avoiding the uh, ends and the streams. Similarly, the middle way approach policy to find uh, a solution to the Tibet problem adopted by His Holiness is also avoiding two extremes. The first extreme is uh, to accept the present situation, the uh, administration adopted by the PRC authorities to the Tibetan people with uh, force and repressive measures. That is one extreme. The other extreme is uh, seeking separation from the PRC. That means restoration of independence once again and avoiding these two streams or the ends, the mid is uh, to seek uh, a solution within the constitutional framework of People's Revolt China. Finding middle way between these two uh, streams, we uh, seek uh, a genuine autonomy for the implementation of the uh, constitutional provisions of national regional autonomy to uh, the uh, minority nationalities as enshrined in the constitution and uh, seeking implementation of uh, these provisions of national regional autonomy is the essence of our middle way approach policy. His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama teaches the importance of universal responsibility around the world and urges that any problem we face should be solved through dialogue. His Holiness also advises that even if the past century was a century of war and struggle, we should strive to make 21st century a new era where conflicts are resolved through dialogue. In his 10th March 1984 statement, His Holiness the Dalai Lama stated, irrespective of varying degrees of development and economic disparities, continents, nations, communities, families, in fact, all individuals are dependent on one another for their existence and well-being. Every human being wishes for happiness and does not want suffering. By clearly realizing this, we must develop mutual compassion, love, and a fundamental sense of justice. In such an atmosphere, there is hope that problems between nations problems within families can be gradually overcome and that people can live in peace and harmony. The nature of middle policy to resolve Tibetan issue is that it neither seeks separation of Tibet from China by restoring Tibet's independence nor accepts the present condition under People's Republic of China. In an effort to resolve the issue of Tibet in a manner that benefits both the sides, it follows a middle path between these two extremes. That is what we call the middle way policy. In order to issue of Tibet, each and every provision of autonomy as stipulated in the Constitution of People's Republic of China and its law on national regional autonomy should be genuinely implemented by the Chinese government and the entire Tibetan people must be brought under a single autonomous administration. Moreover, nonviolence should be the only means to achieve these objectives. These are the inviolable principles of middle way policy. Today's world is such that there is no way one can make a policy that is not pragmatic or inconsistent with the reality. Time for countries to pursue their individual rights alone is gone. Many countries now forgo some of their individual sovereign rights by joining federations like European Union to achieve common interests. 
Moreover, today's reality is that no countries can live in isolation without depending on others. There are many nations that allow high degree of autonomous arrangements based on race, culture and language. These autonomous arrangements are not only well established, but they contribute in strengthening the stability and integrity of respective nations. Even with 6 million Tibetans, most of the areas in eastern and northeastern Tibet were gradually sliced from under the Kandan Potang government. And in 1951, when Tibet lost its independence, the size of Tibet was not more than the area of today's so-called Tibet Autonomous Region. Thus, for the both the short-term and the long-term benefits of Tibetan people, and in the view of fact that more than 50% of the Tibetan lives outside Tar, it is better to have a meaningful autonomy for all Tibetans. This needs a serious consideration by all Tibetans. Tibet is a landlocked country. Therefore, it has to rely on its powerful neighbors for its economy and modern material development. In fact, Tibet remaining within the People's Republic of China will gain more material benefits. In order to continue the large-scale activities for the cause of Tibet, it is necessary to garner the support of governments and the organizations to carry out a struggle at global level. It is also indispensable to sustain the central Tibetan administration until the eventual resolution of the Tibet issue. A way has to be found out, particularly to save Tibetan culture, environment and Tibetan identity from the urgent situation of being completely destroyed inside Tibet. The Middle Way policy was conceived by His Holiness. However, His Holiness unilaterally did not impose it. It was democratically adopted. In 1959, led by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, over 80,000 Tibetans were forced to come into exile. During the initial years of exile, we were engaged with immediate and urgent tasks of catering to the educational needs of young Tibetans preservation of Tibetan religion and culture, as well as rehabilitation of Tibetan refugees. Therefore, we were not able to formulate a definite policy that concerns the future political status of Tibetan people. However, from around 1967, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, taking into consideration the prevailing situation in the world in general, and China in particular, held a series of discussions with the chairman and the vice chairman of Tibetan parliament in exile, the Kashak, and other people who were part of decision-making body at that time, and the Friends of Tibet. An internal decision was then made in 1974 to pursue a policy of securing a meaningful autonomy for Tibet when the opportunity arises for the dialogue with the Chinese government. Since 1979, uh, we, uh, on the initiative from the Chinese government, we developed direct uh, contact with Chinese government. And it's my personal emissary uh, when first visited Peking and at that time had uh, uh, opportunity meeting with Ting Xiaoping. At that time, Ting Xiaoping stated the question of independence uh, we cannot discuss, we cannot negotiate on that, on that point. Beside that, everything open, we can discuss, he mentioned. So, since then, my main concern, as I mentioned earlier, the Tibetan culture, you see, Tibetan environment, uh, Tibetan human rights, these are something immediate, you see, the, how say, the uh, concern. Therefore, you see, the, I, uh, since then, the, I sent about, I think, about uh, six, delegation. My whole approach is based on that Ting Shaving statement. So I usually call my whole approach in order to solve Tibetan issue, Tibetan problem, is it a, I call middle way. In 1987, 
His Holiness announced his long-term vision for Tibet, the five-point peace plan at U.S. Congress. In 1988, His Holiness announced the Strasbourg proposal at European Parliament to elaborate on the fifth point of the five-point peace plan. This was the first major explanation on the middle way policy. The Tibetan uh, should govern, what say, the democratic self-government. Self uh, meantime, you see, uh, Chinese side, of course, you see, keen, how to say, interest or major concern is defense and foreign affairs. So, you see, in these two fields, you see, could, um, how to say, um, carried by Chinese. And basically, some kind of, you see, relation, what to call, association right. with PRC uh, government. From 6 to 9 June 1988, a four-day special political meeting was organized in Dharamsala. This conference was presided over by Kashak and attended by members of Tibetan parliament in exile, public servant, NGOs, newly arrivals from Tibet, special invitees, and other representing the exiled Tibetan. A thorough discussion on the text of proposal was done, and finally, it was unanimously endorsed. This was the first time such a policy was adopted through democratic process by not only consulting the Tibetan parliament in exile and the Kasha, but also directly solicitating the views of delegates representing the Tibetan public. After Sino-Tibetan contracts broke down in 1993, His Holiness proposed in his 10th March 1996 and 1997 statements that the Tibetan people should decide on the best possible course of action to resolve the issue of Tibet through referendum. Accordingly, as a preliminary to such a referendum, the Tibetan parliament in exile and the Kashak provided the Tibetan people with four alternatives to debate and to work. However, more than 64% of the Tibetan people inside and outside expressed the opinion that there was no need to hold a referendum and that they would support the middle way policy or whatever decision His Holiness took in accordance with the changing political situation in the world. To this effect, 18 September 1997, the Tibetan parliament in exile adopted a unanimous resolution stating that His Holiness should decide on the issue of Tibet from time to time in accordance with the changing political situation in China and in world. It was further resolved that whatever decision His Holiness takes will be regarded by all Tibetan people as no different from a decision arrived through a referendum. His Holiness, when informed of this decision made by the majority of people and unanimous by the Tibetan parliament in exile, responded through his 10th March 1998 statement that he would continue his middle way policy. This was the second time such a policy was adopted democratically. From 17th to 22nd November 2008, a six-day special meeting was held in Dharamsala in accordance with the Article 59 of the Charter of Exiled Tibetan. Out of the view solicited from nearly 600 representatives who attended the meetings and the written opinions from their respective communities as well as opinion collected from among the Tibetans in Tibet, over 80% of them expressed support for the middle way policy. This was the third time for the Tibetan people to adopt such a policy through a democratic process. Similarly, on 20th March 2010, the Tibetan parliament in exile, after having discussed the text of motion of thanks on His Holiness, message adopted unanimous resolution supporting the middle way policy once again. This was the fourth and the last decision arrived through democratic process. Middle way policy is the best way to resolve conflict among the people. It is also a giant political step ahead. It has the power to benefit the Tibetan and the Chinese people to live together in harmony. It also has the benefit for
for nationalities to live as equal without any discriminations. It helps in creating friendship among the nationalities, stability of the society, and to respect the unity of People's Republic of China. In the year 2008, during the eighth round of dialogue, we uh, spelled out the present status of our uh, middle way approach policy within the constitutional framework of PRC. And uh, we had submitted uh, a comprehensive memorandum on the implementation of general autonomy for the entire city of the Tibetan people. And this memorandum has been uh, entirely based on the uh, letters and spirit of the uh, PRC's present constitution. Each constitutional provisions of uh, autonomy have been uh, quoted uh, close by close. And uh, we also explain how it can be implemented for the entirety of Tibet people and also the means and ways how to implement it. Now, this uh, memorandum is uh, in the public domain and uh, anyone interested can find it on the internet. And uh, which is uh, uh, our latest position about the details of the uh, Midabel approach policy. The Strasbourg proposal was rejected by the Chinese government, saying that it was but independence, semi-independence, or independence in disguise. Besides attempting to distort Tibet's history and the current situation inside Tibet, PRC said that the proposal did not recognize China's sovereignty of Tibet or that the latter was an inalienable part of the former. Likewise, on 10 November 2008, Executive Vice Minister of the United Work Front Department, Tu Wing Chu, made this false statement about the Middle Way policy. We pointed out, though large numbers of obscure words were intentionally used in the memorandum, we could still see clearly that they did not give up their consistent splitting opinions, thus so-called genuine autonomy, and other requests mentioning in the memorandum intend to set the central united leadership against the regional autonomy system so as to deny, restrict, and weaken the power of central authorities as well as the authority of the National People's Congress in legislation. What's more, the splitting clique tried to revise the constitution so that it could actually process the right as an independent state does. The memorandum title and contains refer to greater Tibetan inhabited area and high degree of autonomy. They are exactly the same as half independence and the convert independence, which are not tolerated in the constitutions. This uh, memorandum was uh, misinterpreted by PRC authorities and uh, therefore during the uh, ninth round of uh, dialogue in the um, year 2010, we have again submitted a note on the memorandum, dispelling all the misconceptions and misinterpretations of the PRC and making further clarifications of the memorandum and uh, how this memorandum is uh, entirely within the constitutional framework of PRC. And uh, that note is also in the public domain on the internet. So if anyone reads the memorandum and not on the memorandum, will understand what kind of the middle way approach policy is seeking for and genuine autonomy to the entirety of the Tibetan people. Chinese scholars, democracy activists, Media personalities and writers, as well as many ordinary Chinese people, support this policy. For example, in his essay, The Right to Self-Government, the new Nobel laureate, Liu Xiaobo, writes that the Dalai Lama's Tibetan demand for autonomy, not only morally sufficient reason, 
but also expressed in real peace negotiation in good faith. The peaceful protests in the Tibetan that took place in Tibet since 10 March 2008 were brutally suppressed by the Chinese authorities and the false propaganda about the causes of peaceful protests were repeated by the authorities. Because of these 29 Chinese intellectuals, writers and democracy activists, including Wang Lusheng and Lu Xiaowo, signed and submitted 12 suggestions for dealing with the Tibet situation to the Chinese government. They wrote, 12 suggestions for dealing with the Tibet situation called on the Chinese government to respect the Tibetan people's right to freely express their views and for the Chinese leader to hold direct dialogue with Dalai Lama. Likewise, Beijing-based Gongmeng Law Research Center released an investigative report into the social and economic causes of 3.14 incidents in Tibetan areas, in which they stated the causes of the protests in Tibet were due to unjust policies in economics, education, religion and politics carried out by the Chinese authorities in Tibet. Since 2008, Chinese scholars, democracy activists, media personalities and writers have written over 900 articles in support of the Tibetan cause. Lately, through Twitter, hundreds of Chinese were in touch with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and they all expressed support for the middle way policy and appeal that Chinese authority redress their wrong policies in Tibet. Although China has not responded to her initiatives, it would not be wrong to say that restart of the talks alone is a step forward. I have no doubt uh, that uh, if we vigorously pursue this policy, uh, it will be successful uh, because Chinese people ultimately, even in an authoritarian system such as the one that exists in China, ultimately the people's voice will prevail. And the Chinese people, intellectuals, uh, young students, uh, people from all walk of life, including many party members, uh, those who have become aware of the middle way approach, are very, very supportive of it. And in fact, they feel that uh, this policy, uh, once it becomes successful, will also greatly benefit the People's uh, Republic of China. Since 2002, nine rounds of talks were held during which China is made aware about the basic aspirations of Tibetans. Even though there has not been any tangible uh, result, uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, I think uh, you know, this process uh, has uh, had its uh, success. Uh, most important is uh, that through this process, we have been able to convey to the Chinese government very clear, very specific uh, position of His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, with regard to solving uh, the issue of Tibet. Uh, a very clear and precise uh, position uh, when and how the Tibetan people can reconcile themselves uh, to the situation of being a part of PRC. Uh, so that itself uh, is a very, very important achievement. Uh, this happened, uh, you know, with the uh, wise guidance of His Holiness, but also with the very, uh, 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 you know, wise uh, leadership also provided by uh, Professor Samdun Uh And then in addition to that, uh, internationally also, uh, through this dialogue process, not only we have managed to create more awareness for Tibet, but again, clear understanding of exactly what is it that the Tibetan people are seeking. Uh, so uh, I can candidly say that uh, the nine rounds of the formal talks uh, that we had with the Chinese government, uh, you know, had its uh, uh, success. As a result of a series of talks with the Chinese side by the His Holiness representatives based on the Middle Way policy, the international community, organizations, democracy activists, intellectuals, the media and a large number of Chinese have learned about the nature of a struggle and the aspirations of Tibetan people based on which they offer their supports.
The mutually beneficial middle way policy has won the support of the European Union, various governments, including the United States, parliaments, organizations, and many educated individuals around the world. They praise this policy because it has just and in accordance with the law. And they also criticize China for not accepting the basic aspirations of Tibetans. For example, since the restart of talks, the U.S. government has repeatedly urged China to resolve the issue of Tibet through talks and has also appointed a special Tibet coordinator. The Obama administration's stand on the Tibet issue is clear from the report on Tibet negotiation March 2009 to February 2010, as required by the Foreign Relations Authorization Act 2003, Section 611. The U.S. State Department has submitted this annual report on Tibet negotiation to the Congress, encouraging substantive dialogue between His Holiness the Dalai Lama or his representative and the Chinese government to resolve long-standing issues. This report outlined the U.S. policy on Tibet, steps taken by the President and the Secretary of the States to encourage PRC to enter into dialogue with His Holiness the Dalai Lama or his representatives, leading to a negotiated agreement on Tibet. Now for this, uh, we have had support from the public from different countries. We have many Tibet support groups all over the world, and they've all feel that the Tibetan cause is a just cause. It deserves support to get their rights. Then we have the very different governments all over the world who also are very sympathetic and have been supporting this position that we have taken. And in many different parliaments in all over the world, there are parliamentary groups, particularly for Tibet, to support the Tibetan cause. A high-level U.S. delegation headed by Speaker of Congress Nancy Pelosi visited Dharamsala to show their genuine solidarity with the Tibetan people after 2008 peaceful protests in Tibet brutally suppressed by the Chinese authorities. Thank all of you for your warm welcome and thank you especially for flying the American flag today. We are very confident about our approach through the middle way approach because uh, so far, as far as I can remember, there's no government in the world who has said that our middle way approach it is not appropriate or is not the way forward. So I think this itself uh, gives us a strong support in the sense that it is morally and ethically and uh, policy-wise very sound and positive since it takes into consideration the interests of both China and Tibet. In November 2009, during his visit to China, the U.S. President Obama raised the issue of Tibet. In fact, during a press conference with Hu Jintao, Obama urged the Chinese government to engage in meaningful talks with His Holiness the Dalai Lama on the issue of Tibet. So today, uh, we've agreed to move ahead with our formal dialogue on human rights. We've agreed to new exchanges to advance the rule of law. Uh, and even as we, the United States, recognize that Tibet is part of the People's Republic of China, the United States continues to support further dialogue between the government of China and the representatives of the Dalai Lama to resolve concerns and differences, including the preservation of the religious and cultural identity of the Tibetan people. On 15 April 2004, the President of European Union visited China, during which he stated to Chinese leaders that it was European Union's foreign policy requirement for China to talk with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. In 2007, a resolution was passed in Canadian Parliament in urging China to resolve the issue of Tibet through talks. In the same way, the Australian government and the parliament has supported the Tibetan cause and to date passed three resolutions support the middle way policy. Likewise, Germany, France and many other governments around the world support the Tibetan cause.